Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to Freaky Feature Friday, where we ask provocative questions, answer unanswerable uh, inquiries, and delve into the unknown with a great sense of narcissistic hubris. Um, okay. Um, I see Holly has a new getup, which is uh, re which is reflecting on or resonant with Ivo, and um, that's cool. Okay, we started this off with the um, Donovan song. First there is a mountain, then there is no mountain, then there is. And um, one of the things we are going to reflect on is that phenomenon, let's say, in, in a couple of different ways. So for example, were there atoms before there were atoms discovered? And now that we don't actually think of atoms as particles in the same way, are there no atoms anymore? Um, what is it for something to come in and out of existence in a certain way? And that's not exactly what Donovan meant, or if he meant what the Buddhists say. Um, but I think we will hopefully find uh, we can thread it all together. So as usual in Freaky Friday, Feature Friday, I have a presentation, I kind of borrow stuff that I've used elsewhere and repurpose it for this. So we will go to the PowerPoint. Okay, so today we're talking about the matrix of existence. And um, we, and so why does it matter? Um, I'm gonna, what do we think is real versus not real? Oh, so, um, and basically we're gonna say that the word existence is the larger category. So we're just gonna use these terms this way. Existence is the larger category and some things are real and others are not real like a, a um, a unicorn, we might say, is not real, but exists because it exists in a certain way. It's imaginal, okay? So existence is all of that. Um, and then we're going to see there's a spectrum or a matrix of existence of things that seem to us to be more or less real, okay? So just some people use the terms the other way around, um, but that's the way we are going to use it. So why does it matter? Um, this is a little cartoon and we see here's this person here and there's different things that exist in his experience. Um, and we might say some are more or less real than others. They all exist, right? We're using, we're not saying they don't exist, uh, but maybe they exist in different ways. And if we're gonna say, why does this matter? Here's a little joke because here's the dog and in the dog's experience, this is what exists in the dog's experience. There's obviously a difference here. And there's a real question of whether or not this, whoops, yeah, whether or not this is the real reason why a dog is happier than you. So this is a comic, right? But when you look at this, um, at first you laugh and maybe you have a romantic ideal of wanting to just be in the dog's reality. Um, but eventually we notice that we would miss, see, because what they do in here is they put almost everything that's, that's uh, unpleasant, uh, here's, although here's some music, but in here, these symbols are almost all unpleasant, right? And if they had put in here 
uh, a lot of pleasant things that were not in your dog's reality, that would be something different. But there is something to this. And um, that's one of the reasons why I would say this, this freaky uh, uh, inquiry um, may matter at some level um, uh, to people. And then we have this uh, quote that we talked about earlier, before I saw enlightenment, the mountains were mountains and the rivers were rivers. While I saw enlightenment, the mountains were not mountains and the rivers were not rivers. And after I reached the Tore or enlightenment, the mountains were mountains and the rivers were rivers. We wanna keep that in the back of our head as to what that means. And um, we might replace this with anything. Before I saw enlightenment, the, uh, the uh, Higgs boson were Higgs bosons and the, and the uh, dark matter was dark matter. And then while I saw in that enlightenment, we could replace these with anything. And it's the ability to replace these, not with just concrete reference, but all parts of experience and experience the same kind of shift and vantage point. So I'm just gonna see this with that. All right, now we're gonna play a game uh, that I hope you will all participate in even if you, you know, what we're gonna to try to do is throw out whatever we think and see if we can work together toward an answer that we're satisfied with. So uh, if, you, if you try to answer it right along, I mean, some of you might have a robust answer right away, that's great. But if we don't start off with a robust answer, um, don't be afraid to have some fun and populate it with guesses that we can improve on, okay? So does everybody know the difference? First, we have to understand these two words. The difference between numerals and numbers. So I will just refresh you. Numeral, like as if I write the numeral two on the paper, the numeral is this physical sign, okay? So in base 10, two functions a certain way. In base four, the numeral two functions in a different way. In base 10, the numeral two points to the number two. In base four, the numeral two functions in a different way, okay? So does everybody understand those, that distinction? Okay, now I want you just off the top of your head to tell me what do you think is more real? the numeral two or the number two and why? The numeral is more real for me as I sit here because I can see it and my seeing it causes a feeling. The number, I have to search to find it. Does anybody vote for a number? Okay, so what this is perfect. A lot of people or most people of our ilk. Yes, it depends upon the vantage point. Most people of our ilk will say the numeral is more real because I can see it. Um, it, it it's there. Um, some people might say, well, the numeral isn't more real, but the ink mark is real, whether I know it's the numeral two or not. So they reduce it a little further. 
But there are mathematicians who think numbers are more real than numerals because they exist independent of us discovering them. So the first thing we have to honor is that this, this feeling of what's more real is really, some people really think like Roger Penrose and the people think that there's, you know, there were platonic ideals before the uh, universe could unfold. They really have this very strong relationship to numbers and transcendental logics and stuff like this. So first we wanna honor the diversity of the way people intuitively respond to these things. Um, it's, it's, it's quite surprising really. Uh, um, and what happens is Certain people like Roger Penrose, he didn't grow up in, envir in an environment where he was told that numbers were real. He was a prodigy that when he discovered like the magic in numbers, it just, it just blew his mind. And he felt that they were ontologically prior to anything else, okay? So we, this is why we call it a, a, a spectrum of reality or the matrix of existence because we want to honor that in the human uh, uh, condition, uh, there's a whole variety of, of ways people um, feel anchored in the real. So uh, Roger Penrose might say, because the number is eternal and doesn't matter what mark I put down to represent it. It exists, it's any, some people call them eternal objects or platonic ideals. So I uh, just wanna get that down on record. And so what I'm gonna try to do is present a process model that includes all of these and how they relate to each other to say that they're all interdependent. The number and the numeral are inter interdependent. Um, the numeral and the motion, the sensory and motor motion is interdependent, et cetera, et cetera. So we're gonna to try to, instead of hanging out in one of these boxes, we're gonna to try to see it from the larger uh, condition of being human. Does that make sense? So that's, that's what we're gonna to try to do. All right. Um, <clears throat> and now we'll go to this. Okay. So um, in this model that is, you know, heuristic, heuristic to help us understand this, why is that like that? Okay. There are four, all of these things exist, but they exist in different ways. And some people would, ha would, would have a very strong intuition that one or the other of these boxes, these kinds of existences are more real than others, okay? So what do we have here? We have here up top things that already are conceived. They're conceptualized in our minds. They've been given names and words. They have non non-physical references. And down here, we have things that are not conceived, okay? Over to the left, we have things that we can observe or that we can observe. And on the right, we have things that are by definition non-observable. So that's what the matrix is between what is conceived and non-conceived and what is observable and not observable. So the easiest box is conceived. Why is that? Can you see this little thing keep coming up? It's what annoy me. The easiest box is conceived observables. So what are they? They're everyday things we can perceive with our senses, point to and talk about. We might call it the hardware of our experience, right? So 
um, we can point to the apple tree, we can point to the book, we can talk about them. That means they have a, they're conceptualized. So if we can give it a name, then there's a concept associated with it. So it's both conceived, conceptualized, it has some shared reality through the concept, and we can point to them at the same time. They're conceived observables. And this is associated with things we call concrete operations, representations, and simple mappings and common sense. So a simple mapping is just the term I give to a chair. I point to it, I can point to it. I might not point to it, but say, can you get me that chair? So this is a level of reality that is a very large group of reality for a lot of people. It's both conceived, it has a symbolic reference, it's, it's linguistic, but it could be uh, more symbolic than that. I can point to it, even though I'm not, I may not be pointing to it because the chair is in the other uh, room or the pearl is at the bottom of the ocean, but I can uh, perceive what my senses and point to it and I can talk about it. Okay. Now over here, we have the conceived non-observables. So by definition, the rules of logic, numbers, platonic ideas, concepts, abstractions, laws, deep code, causality, the, well, let's, that one's a little tricky. These are not observable, right? So the number two, we can't observe. The numeral two, we can observe. By definition, the way we relate to the numbers and the platonic ideas are that they are de by definition non-observable. I can know the rules and laws of logic, but I can't see them. I can't point to them. We can, I can talk about them because they're conceived, but they're by definition not observable. Kant called them transcendentalia. Um, so these are abstract operations, systemic and metasystemic reasoning, rationality, these higher order operations. Okay, so we're pretty comfortable with those two. And what we're saying is they both exist and they're both real, but some people think some one side, of, one box is actually more real than the other box. Some people think that the, the, the ideas, the platonic ideas or the essences of things give rise to the ability to perceive uh, categories in the concrete world. That's an old fashioned way of, of uh, saying it. There are some modern idealists out there, but these things are both, all, they're all real. They're real in different ways is what I'm trying to uh, convey. Now these two boxes are, are a little weirder. So non-conceived observables are physical objects in the world that we have not yet discerned with language or concepts. They're not yet discovered. So before anyone discovered microorganisms, right? They observed, um, they didn't, observe, well, they didn't observe them, but they could observe them, but they saw some causal thing, something happening, and they went looking for the physical objects that they had not yet discerned. They didn't have concepts because they didn't understand pathogens, but there's some, there's some uh, doorway or entrance to this, to this domain that we'll talk about. So how do we find non-conceivable observa observables? They're usually, we go looking for unknown causes. So that, that's the story I just told you. You see people dying. There's a certain pattern you're seeing. You don't have a theory of, of pathogens, but you go looking for something that you don't even know you're looking for. And you bump into this category. Um, you, you start conceiving and observing them through 
uh, creating technologies by which you can observe them, and then creating theories by which you can understand their causal relationship. So the biggest, one of the most common ways we get into here is we, we're searching for unknown causes. Uh, incomplete theories. Um, this is um, like uh, um, we know, for example, that they discovered, I think it was Neptune because they had theory of gravity and um, the theory was incomplete because the planets were kind of out of sync. So they went looking for um, a, a another planet or the periodic table. They had a theory of all these elements. They haven't discovered all of them, but the, the theory was incomplete and said there are there are other elements that would be of this way in this character because I have empty boxes here. So sometimes the theory, sometimes the, what we observe, uh, the unknown causes we observe start to populate this. And sometimes the theory we believe in uh, starts to um, create an exploration to find them. And this is what Bashkar called the alethic truth. He said that because we actually live in the real world, we don't li just live in this part of the world, we live in the world that we have not yet conceived of and observed. Um, this is why we can, science can go forward um, because we're not limited to just what we have observed and have conceived like our dog, but we can suss out what is absent from our theories and absent from what we are looking for. This is a very interesting, um, uh, it's a very interesting capacity of the human to go looking for what's not there um, is very, very interesting way to, to think about that. And he says, because we live in the real world, we can go looking for what's, what's not there. And these are the ways in which the, it, it usually happens. The most common one is from unknown causes, uh, but then sometimes you have theories that are so robust, they say, well, this theory is so robust, I've got two holes in here. There must be something real that is functioning, that is taking on these characters. Does that make sense? Okay, and now we have this fascinating section over here. And these are the conceptual systems, ideas, codes, abstractions, rules of logic, structures of thought and math and systems that are not yet invented. So they used to have real numbers and then they needed to invent non-real numbers uh, and somehow we invent new, new systems that function like this or we discover them. If you think these things are more real then we discover them or as John Dravicki said, it's a process of inventio which is both discovering and inventing. Inventing ways to discover is what I like to say. We invent ways to discover and we discover ways to invent. Um, but this is a fascinating um, capacity of people to um, come up with new paradigms, new ways of thinking and reasoning, new conceptual systems. And the interesting thing about it is there are fields of work like theoretical math, where people just invent these things um, and then and eventually, and sometimes they sit on the shelf for years before they're useful, non-Euclidean geometry. Somebody invented a world where um, lines were not parallel, that lines were in a curved surface. So like the earth, if you follow one of the uh, longitude lines, even though they're parallel at the equator, they intersect at the North Pole and then they become parallel again. So someone 
imagined, well, what would be what would math be like in this kind of realm where lines were not, there were no parallel lines. They all existed in curved space. And this was invented before uh, the notion of curved space became part of uh, physical theory and then it was pro proved useful. So this is really interesting how um, the mind can create uh, through experiment and creative imagination um, uh, con conceived non-observables that haven't existed before. Are there any questions? Yeah, well, I just want to ask about the um, the bottom left corner there. So, say with the Higgs boson, it hadn't yet been um, discovered, but it was posited. So, in some sense, it had been conceived as as an idea, as a concept that then could be tested and then eventually found. I mean, they may not have found it, obviously, but they but they eventually did. So, it seems to be almost like a hybrid status. Yeah. It's the, yeah. So it's almost like. A, one of those robust theories that has a hole. And I knew some, I almost used that as an example because it is now nuanced, right? Because it's, it's, it's more of like the theory has a hole in it, um, <clears throat> but it's not conceptually, uh, it's not, it's not conceptually, uh, filled out yet. In fact, uh, Sabina ha Hoffenstetter, if you ever watch her, she says that um, she, and, and it's for reasons about how this works, that um, she thinks that that the theories are driving the, the, the reality of what they see, what the experimentals see, see. So it is an interesting, is an interesting relationship, but you're exactly right. It's not as uh, there's no, it's not as clean as that. Um, <clears throat> uh, whereas the periodic table, it is a conceive of that this is how elements are, but they had no idea what the elements were. That was a little more naive. I was also going to use you know dark matter and dark energy are real hybrids because they're conceived, but they're not platonic ideals. They're physical things that are by definition non-observable. So I would say this is why they are in transition because, because instead of people thinking of them as platonic ideals, they think of them as on the left hand side as existing as if they were on the left hand side, but they are by definition non observable. And so these kind of cutting edge really fuck up with the, this matrix of existence. This is for my master's students, and you know, they take a master's in transpersonal psychology, so they don't ask such good questions. But I would say it's robust enough to say that's why dark matter and dark energy is suspect. Because it's taking it's taking one aspect of the human condition and saying, oh, but unlike everything else over here, they're by definition non-observable, but they're not concepts. So I would say that that is what I call positing a third term. I would say there's a theory, their theory has a hole in it, um, which you can tidy up by saying there's something real there, uh, but then you have to say, but by definition, it's not observable. So, um, yeah, so so uh, I would just say that's what makes it a transitional phase. It, it, I, I don't, uh, I, I uh, had, was in a uh, presentation with the woman whose husband and her, um, mostly her husband uh, came up with the math 
that predicted either one or both dark matter or dark energy. And it's basically that you just can't make the math work unless you have this, right? And, and so I'm, I think that it's still over there in the bottom left-hand corner. Um, and of course, the whole idea is to try to put everything in the top left-hand corner because what's in the top left-hand corner is easy for us to manipulate. We just understand it, even if it, it's like the iPhone or the computer. I don't understand anything about it, but I can use it because the pace of technology has turned it into something that just functions for me, like stuff in the top left-hand corner. And that's the human enterprise, right? Um, I don't even have to work in the top right-hand corner anymore. I just use a calculator. And this is the uh, collective uh, genius of the human enterprise. Holly? Yeah, I'm curious how language maps onto this quadrant. Um, so language in here, if it's simple language, like it's a pointing to language, the chair, then it's in the top left because it's an observable and it's conceived by that term. I have a little bit of a conception that it's a chair. So when I go into the room and you tell me to get the chair, I might be thinking of something with four legs and a back. And all I see are flat round things with stools, but you've told me to go get the chairs. So I bring them, so I have a concept of it. So that's, that's rep, rep in the top left-hand corner are, is representational language. Ivo. I know there's a more complex question after that. So let's let's sit with that and then, yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah. I was also wondering like how, how, where, you know, since we're doing the fitting game, um, like your, your idea of, um, or, or non-idea of a complex potential state, you know, sits. Oh, that's an interesting question. That's in the bottom right-hand corner. It it's, is. it's making up a paradigm. It's completely creative and imaginal, and it may find use in the world. For me, for for me, it's and so we'll see how it fits because then once you have made something up, you can then use it in the world to see what effects it has. Right? So like uh, unreal numbers, people made it up. Lee Smolin is a theoretical physicist. He's always making, he, he's made up this whole new idea of how time works. Yeah. But nobody can fit it to anything practical. So it stays there in the bottom right hand corner. But one day something might happen and it's like, oh my God, if we use that and we use dark matter, and then, and then the thing becomes more real to more people. Mm. But I, I experience my, <clears throat> my complex potential states as speculative philosophy. Um, but I find that um, it has, it has very significant uh, benefits to um, as as the as the as they do these paradigms, they have benefits because then they make observables that you haven't observed come forward. Mm -hmm. So I I can like I observed um, that. Um, I don't know, this is a stretch, but I mean, I have been using this whole idea of not thinking of things as adapting or being under adaptive pressure to each other. So I stopped thinking of the leaves of the tomatoes fighting for each other for sun and 
then noticing if I didn't do anything about it, that I would notice different things. And it can lead you to explorations that then can make, uh, make what you're actually observing, you put it in a different context. And then you start to see even more things. You go looking for things. So when Darwin came up with the theory of evolution, you know, evolution is so, First, it's misunderstood, but it's so uh, um, been so popularized and reduced in what it actually means. Like that, most people think evolution is like developmental stage theory. You know, things just keep progressing on and on and on. But like, no monkey ever became a person, and no person's ever going to become a transhuman. This is not what. Uh, or a posthuman, whatever the ones you could become a cyborg, but you, this is this is not how it happens. You don't just get better at better at something until you're another another species. And if you really understand evolution, you understand what a completely creative act of imagination it was. You know, because before then they thought, well, then over years the, the giraffes keep, keep stretching their necks until, you know, these 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 things, and um, because uh, because up until then we only had developed construction, a theory of construction that things changed by constructing things, like God just constructed the world, <clears throat> or things changed because it was like an organism that there was an egg that developed over time. That's development. Those are the only theories of change we had. And even modern people don't understand that the dynamics of evolution are much different than development. And now, of course, we have this Darwinian, what I call the Darwinian attitude, which is a perversion of evolution. We Most people think evolution means that different organisms, species, uh, create adaptive pressure on each other. The environment creates adaptive pressure on species. This is, this is not at all, has nothing to do with evolution. Adaptive systems thinking has nothing to do with evolution. Like when, when, the, when the asteroid came down and destroyed all the large, very large reptiles and some of the very large mammals, it didn't put adaptive pressure on the shrews to carry on the mammalian lineage. The shrews just got ha, had it found an open niche that was closed to them before. And so this whole idea that evolution has anything to do with like adaptively pressuring everything else. And now the environment is creates adaptive pressure. You know, this is all, this is all popular imagination, right? So I really, really am very impressed by the move from developmental theory to evolutionary theory. I've written for a long time about like the evolutionary spirituality people, they're developmental spiritual spiritualists. They don't, it's not really an evolutionary view. And my attempt to move the discussion away from Darwinian attitude is actually more consistent with evolutionary theory. Um, and also informed, because I think you saw my Friday feature by this experience I had about losing my job and just looking up into the future. And there was nothing, there was, how can you spring ahead when there's nothing to push against, you know? And so this is, this, became a new theory of change. It exists in the bottom right-hand quadrant. Um, you can, that then it may or may not be useful for some of the pickles or closed loops. I think we're in closed loops uh, of thinking. Um, so that's where I would put, put, um, put that. Uh, Einstein's theories are, Many of them are in there, and then years later, they get more and more proof because the observable effects, if the theory of, is right, become more observable over time because they create
create experiments and technologies to observe those things. So um, these big paradigm shifts are also are also in there. You know, as um, Jan Blin said, if I do this, you observe something. And it used to be that the earth had an affinity for objects and the love of the objects pushed it down. And then it was um, the force of gravity. And now it is that actually the pen is pulling on the earth and the earth is pulling on the pen because that's what mass does. So you have to separate the paradigm that the observation is happening in from the observation. <clears throat> Was that helpful? Any other questions before we move on? Okay, so we have these four boxes and as you all are aware, they're useful, but there's a lot of gray area in between because um, nothing this <laughs> comprehensive can fit in a matrix, but it's an interesting way to, um, yeah, to, to think about these things. Hopefully, I'll find out something interesting. Okay, so this is a very big slide. I wish I had had the part where the pieces, I didn't have the animated one where the parts would come by themselves. Okay, so we can, here's our big boxes, the conceived observables and the conceived non-observables. Uh, the non-conceived observables and the non-conceived non-observables. And I'm going to try to convince you that all of these things are just simple human processes. Now, what I mean by human processes is not one human's doing all of this, right? Uh, so somebody's inventing math, somebody's doing an experiment, they can't figure out what's going on, they, they find this math that helps them with the problem, you know, we're talking about the human, uh, uh, the sum total of collective human intelligence. But you see that we have a very simple, uh, it's kind of an explosion of our simple formula. There's arousal, there's, uh, there's a movement toward perception and then actions that satisfy. And this whole thing ends up with anchoring and I think an important thing. So just bear with me here. So we have a uh, perception. I see something as a child, let's say, and I'm told what it is. And then that satisfies me. Perception, uh, so this is, there, this is a small arousal, uh, um, uh, in this case, the action is a micro action or, or hearing or speaking the word. So, the, so we have perception and then we have ideas that satisfy. But if these ideas are incomplete or inconsistent, so I see the, I see the animal, I say kitty and I feel satisfied. And then the kitty starts to do something that's not kitty-like. So I, it's an inconsistent, my idea is inconsistent with the perception. So then I need to add in a new creative imaginary or a new word, or maybe sometimes the kid invents a new word, right? Because they see that the idea, the word it has, it's, it's the only idea they have, which is a representation. It's incomplete or inconsistent. And so it can create another word. And kids do this all the time and then we correct them. And in order to take to test that, then I might pull the thing's tail twice to make sure that it doesn't act 
like a kitten. And then I see that it's consistent with that. Now, if you think of the platypus, right? The platypus is kind of like this. You see something swimming. Does everybody know what a platypus is? Okay, it's a mammal that lays egg that looks like a seal with a beak like a duck. <laughs> it's like, it's Google's attempt to create a mammal. You know, they got too many departments working. Okay, so you have a perception and then you say, oh, it's a, well, I don't know. Is it a fur covered bird or is it a duck egg -leg -leg laying mammal? And then you have to have some creative ideas and then you've got to participate with it. Oh, well, let me look at it. Let me see it. Oh, it gives milk. Okay, now I'm going to change my hot, hot definition is mammal. It's milk. Uh, they, they drinks milk, so it's a mammal. Hey, does a dolphin, a dolphin must nurse their babies. Does a dolphin nurse their babies? That's interesting. So that what happens is it goes around and around like this. But the point is, so now I have, if I think of the atom, or, or if I have, um, I perceive that people are dying in London or France, I guess, Louis Pasteur. Um, I don't have ideas that satisfy. I don't really have any creative imaginaries, but I need to start participating with it. This is experimental. I start looking for things that are different. So I start pulling things apart. I may need to invent a microscope it, the, to, to, in order for this to become real, the participation might be so great, I need to invent a microscope. In my paper, I showed how the atom required 120 different inventions in order to perceive it. That's the level of participation that needed, we needed to be able to perceive enough so we could satisfy our ideas with the creative imaginaries that we had along, along the way. And so um, uh, this, is, this is the cycle of bringing existence into reality. I mean, we actually bring existence into reality. They're all real. I'm saying they're all real, but there's this human project of bringing existence into reality. And I would say, okay, so here's some other words. So when I have conceived observables, I might discern something different. I might perceive them in a little different way. I, oh no, there's two different things happening there. There's some electrons that do this, most of them do, but some of them don't do that. I've made a new discernment. So now I have to create, well, I'm gonna conceive, well, maybe there's something like electron spin. And then I can try to get more precision. So between these two is you perceive with more discernment. And so you need more precision in how you conceive of it. We already went through this one. We have a conception we, or a theory, it's inconsistent. Um, we have, so we start building new theories. Uh, those are incomplete and we go around and around between the incomplete and inconsistency between theories. In this one, we have um, something is absent, right? So we have, um, a, a, a people are dying, what is absent is the cause. We need to go and work with new uh, ideas in order to then participate. Those new ideas drive the kind of participation that we have to try to presence new, uh, make these into more conceived observables. And here we have, um, once we get stuck, we can get stuck 
in the conceived observables so that we, um, <clears throat> we um, have this con, uh, what's a conceived observable? Um, we say that gravity pulls the pen down. We're stuck in the idea of gravity, which is a co conditioned elaboration, or we're stuck in the Darwinian attitude. So all we see is things under pressure from other things. Then we try to go into the alethic truth try to say, well, what is it that I just can participate with differently and get some sensory clarity? So this is the way we get out of looking at things um, under the conditioned paradigm and we can't, we can't see out of it. So these are, we know this one from science, the theory is either inconsistent or incomplete. Uh, precision in discernment here is a uh, something that we can work on. Absenting and presencing is something that Roy Bashkar wrote a lot about. And this is a basically a Buddhist move that we can't see the forest for tr the trees because our conception of what we see is so conditioned. Uh, we have to return to basic sensory clarity, live in the alethic truth, and try to then uh, clean this up. So this is a very quick overview of um, the matrix of existence and how things move. I mean, basically, we, we collectively bring things into more reveal or, or reality um, through this spectrum of reality or the spectrum of existence. Why can I ask, um, can those arrows go in different directions? Like, can you move? Yeah, from... they kind of go like that. Okay, so like you could go from ideas that satisfy into perception? Yes. Okay. Yeah, you know, I was looking at it, it's an old slide, and I was thinking the same thing, depending upon how you looked at it, because they, they co-create they co each other. So, um, yeah, it's, it's more like, it can go around, around, or around, and around this way. I think also a case could be made. You know, I say that the matrix goes around that way, but it depends where where you want to start your story. Steve? Yeah, um, I wanted to ask about <clears throat> the interplay between intuition and precision. So, if we take the case of say Einstein, in some ways, general relativity existed for him as an intuition. <laughs> before it existed as a worked out theory. And the kind of the, 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 you know, the big sort of story that goes to this is he kind of knew that he needed Riemann, Riemannian geometry to be able to explain it, but he either didn't have time or didn't want to audit the course. So he asked his friend to attend the course and teach him the bits he needed <laughs> for his theory. So in some sense, he, you know, he, his intuition already had a shape and, and he already had told him that there was, he needed Riemannian geometry um, and he only needed a bit of Romanian geometry, so he didn't need to study the whole of Romanian geometry. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And, yeah, um, yeah. That, but on the other hand, he needed to establish it with full precision to pass the bar of acceptance as a as a scientific theory. Yeah. So this is a great story. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Okay, so yeah, you, uh, so it's Riemann, yeah, not not non-Euclidean. You know, his wife was a was a world class mathematician. I read this, so even probably her colleagues or her or something helped him out. Okay, so we could tell the stories in many ways using this. So, like. Um, uh, obviously realized that there was some discernment and precision to be made. Um, but he also lived in the alethic truth because he had this thing in his mind. I know this is probably, you could, there's much more to the story than this, but this whole notion of when he was on the elevator and going up felt, felt like gravity. And then he, then he thought, so, so this is a, kind of like a 
embodied participation, didn't have a lot of conceptual to it. That's the intuitive part. Um, or he would imagine, well, if this is true about relativity, what if I'm on a train going at the speed of light? Then in fact, two trains coming at the speed of light, the speed of light would still be the speed of light. And you could test all these things, you know? So that's what I would call more of just the participation, you know, in terms of, because he's participating in a very concrete kind, it's imaginative, but it's quite concrete. Do you know what I'm saying? Um, and so, um, and then, and, and then we're not sure how much of the, the paradigm work or the math was done by him or in, in co collusion with other people. Um, but I think if it hadn't solved something that didn't make the theory more precise, um, it would have, I mean, there's a lot of people, like Eric Weinstein is like that, you know, he's got something that is supposedly, do you know his thing, revolutionary, a new geometric way of understanding the integration of quantum mechanics and relativity, because you have to move to completely different. And a lot of people spend a lot of time talking with them, but they don't think it solves, it doesn't present what is absent or doesn't solve a certain problem in there or they don't understand each other. So, um, um, but I find Eric Weinstein's working much more with just the stuff on the right-hand side and not so much with investigating something that could be practically participated with to see, to see if it, it's help, it's useful, right? So if it's not useful, um, it usually doesn't become that real for us, right? It has less reality to it. Um, But it's this notion of participation, you know, it's all the all. So Darwin's theory had them going looking for something that could carry the information through a breeding process, let's say. So then you go now, a new theory creates more different kind of participation. And then like neuroscience is like this new theories of embedded cognition. Now the neuroscientists are looking for something different. And then it kind of goes around and around. Um, and I think that the, the biggest thing about this, the, you know, these presentations are really fast, but the, the biggest thing is to understand that without adequate participation, it doesn't, you can't bring a new theory or a new, you can't move it into the upper left hand corner if you don't participate with it. And some of these things require huge amounts of participation in order. And so, that doesn't make them less real because the amount of participation, like if I see something in the grass and I've been told, don't go there, there's a snake in the grass. And if I look closely, I still can't discern whether there's a rope or a snake, I might have to go and poke it. But that doesn't mean that whole process is the process of revealing the real. And so just like that level of participation is required, these things like atoms and they need a, just a whole lot more participation on a collective scale to realize them, right? And so um, that's why I think science has causal efficacy in the world. You know, someone said, a, people don't, the problem with science is that we learn science, we learn the theory, 
and we learn the math behind the theory, and we think that that's how scientists work, right? And then we sit around like normal people, and nothing, nothing comes to us like that, like, right? And we don't realize that science is mostly tinkering, and the tinkering perfects the theory. So someone said that a, an airplane's a theory wrapped in aluminum. And if you look at the history, like even that movie uh, with Leonardo DiCaprio, he's a, not a Boeing, he's a, uh, what, what airline, airport, airline did he start? Uh, it's a great biography, not Pan Am, it's, uh, um, uh, Hughes, I think Howard Hughes, Hughes. Um, you notice that they keep, in airlines like this, they keep trying something and it crashes. And then they observe what is crashing and then they make small changes and small changes. And once the thing flies, then they backfill their theory because the, the, the participation perfects their theory. It's not the other way around. But once you have the theory, then you can work backwards and say, well, I'm gonna build a plane. I know I have to do this, this, and this, and this, because that's what the theory says. And so it's this notion that we participate in the real to create science is why science and the human project of constructing reality is real. I am thinking about the, um, I don't know if you've heard, like when Christopher Columbus came and the ships were coming in, the indigenous people couldn't see them. Do you, do you... Yeah, there's a lot of controversy about okay, that. I, I, thought, I thought that was true for a long time. Um, uh, I, don't, I don't think they, they knew what it was. Um, so they couldn't see ships. Um, But you know, they didn't they didn't look at stars and not see stars, but they didn't know. I mean, it's so I don't think that's true. Um, you know, uh um I don't have a, a hard reference for that, but I did believe that when I, for a long time I thought that was a, a very interesting factoid point to, uh, to think about these like these things it's very postmodern you don't have a name for it you can't see it um Anything else? I hope hope you find oh Alex. Yeah, hi, just uh was wondering about this. Um you know, so we're if you presume the sort of open-endedness to the exploration of science and the process of realizing the, these uh, unknowns and imagined uh, clues that are leading you to discovery, is there a, what is the mechanism to, that sets the limit on that so that you, so that science doesn't sort of go past a point where it becomes um, degradational to the system as a whole. Is, does that fit? You know, is there a limitation that we can recognize? In other words, that says, don't go past this boundary. <laughs> Um, 
a limitation to science or a limitation to how much destruction science can have or just just um of science the scientific collective self-awareness that feeds back into we better not chase this um and noble unknown some things are best either because they're they're irrational they never like pie it's like you'll, you don't realize you're trying to chase pie and you're expending all these energies you know you're trying to chase the the something that can't be finalized you're trying to finalize or concretize something that can't be um for all practical purposes finalized or and it's a waste of energy or you're actually running the risk of saying like the dog in your image at the beginning was basically peaceful <laughs> and the the cloud of confusion over the human you know it seemed like it seems like the more science it's like a double-edged sword the more it finds of these unknown and chases after these clues to put them in that upper left hand box if possible then the more cacophonic you know the more that becomes like a cacophony in that cloud and it becomes sort of removed from say common everyday peaceful existence so i'm just kind of <laughs> feeling into that like what is the feedback mechanism that tells us to to limit or to stop looking yeah so i mean we can look at it in different ways uh, I, um where i think we're at with science is um you know these these kind of rhythms of science like these early on there's these great breakthroughs in science that have really been helpful to people um and medical science and all kinds of science and then there's something happening like today which it's like it's it's at, at it's 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 past its peak you know like this is what ivan illich said and so um, everything it does now is in, either in the wrong direction or not helpful or actually harmful. And part of it is because I, I would say, number one, in many cases, we are compounding too much in the right hand side. So we have a theory and then we just look for more things and do more things inside that theory and we don't go through adequate participation. This is certainly true in farming and gardening. Like uh, you've heard me tell it, uh, you know, some of my own, I've been the, in the industry for 30 years. And once I got down to doing it myself, I'm like, everything I learned was just not, was in the wrong direction. And the same thing if you do uh, like alternative medicine and you see how simple the body can heal, like, so it's kind of like we're trying to fit reality into the theory rather than the theory to become more and more enable us to potentiate reality. So I would say that, um, um, you know, we have huge uh, schooling puts, what do we put into people's cognition? We don't put anything in the left-hand corner, bottom left-hand corner into their schooling. Well, maybe they can play sports. You know, maybe they can run a lab experiment. They're not really doing it experiment. Everything we put into them is just in the right, upper right-hand corner or the right-hand corner or the upper right-hand corner. These rules and laws that are, that are, and they don't know how to participate, use that to participate. Um, part of the reason why was because in the great advance, if you think of, if you think of this is Donald Merlin's work uh, or Merle, Merlin Donald's work uh, about, the, um, about the modern mind and it, it goes with extended cognition, but you have a point at which you have to have generations of people in the school system to store what the human race knows, 
in their heads before we had computers. You could store it into books, but if you didn't have people that could read the books and had the cognitive capacity to unpack what it said. So we basically used human beings as, as storage space for the knowledge we were compounding. Where else are you gonna put it? You couldn't put it anywhere else. So there was no participation needed. You just needed to interface, like, like Steve said, Einstein needed to know someone who did that work in order for someone else to do that work. And so one of the things that we, if we look for technology going forward, if it can store the stuff in the right hand, upper right hand corner, then what we need to do is get people back to, you know, original participation. Um, and, and notice that, okay, all my life I believed that, but it's not really true. You know, it's, it, that's not really what happens, you know? Um, and, and then we need more work in the bottom right-hand corner, because for me, of course, it's my thing. I'm sure there's hundreds of others is the Darwinian attitude. It just, it's just, you know, it's, it's an arm, everything's an arms race. We can only think of the economy and technology and nature and the human evolution as everything leveraging everything else until there's no, there's, no, there's no space left. And then we can say things, well, and then the system gets more complex, but then all the systems get more complex and then they leverage each other. You know, this is, this is a what I call epistemic closure. Um, so um, can we, there's, if we could switch paradigms, then there's whole new sciences to happen, new economies, new sciences, new ways of bringing forth. And this of course is what I would say, potentials in the system we do not see, right? Um, so I would say, uh, we need more of the bottom to left. We need adequate participation and more. There's a lot of creative imaginaries happening in the world, but we need more space for it to be funded into participatory experiment. And, you know, so we have people doing like ecosystem recovery experiments in South America, but there's no funding because it doesn't fit inside an established paradigm. We need to fund those kinds of things uh, and bring, bring it, and it's still science and bring science forward, Steve. Yeah, it's, it's sort of a continuation of that point, really, and, and also the, the question I was asking before, but it, it, it it's, I mean, I can talk mainly from physics, so that was where my, my experience was, but um, it, it seems that actually a lot of innovation, I mean, there's the tinkering stuff and then people trying to work out how to, how to fix that crash problem or whatever, but the kind of particularly paradigm stuff, but even smaller innovation seems to come from intuition. So within physics, and people probably don't know this, but a, a kind of the greatest compliment you can pay a, a physicist or theoretical physicist is to say they've got great physical intuition, <laughs> you know? And uh, um, so there's a sense that somehow that they in, intuit what, what nature is trying to say or what, where, how it's structured or whatever. And I also wonder how that links to um, Gendlin or Gendlin's um, felt sense which is, is meant to be more sort of holistic and more kind of, I think you're saying like the elitic truth, but maybe kind of more based in there. So I find it quite interesting that, that most of the really interesting work in physics comes from, from that place rather than from staring at an equation for hours, you know. I think it has something to do with two capacities that are usually isolated. So this is why we have, they're rare individuals. One is you certainly have to have enough complexity to understand the physics because then you're just like me you're you're it's telling part of the story and i know there's a million different nuances that that are part of the story okay so but there's a sense that all innovative thinkers they release the complexity they say but what if what if something can be a particle and a wave at the same time why not it's not very sexy and it's not that in it's ingenious, but there's this move of releasing complexity. And of course, it's, it's not a naive move, like 
but it's something about noticing that a certain noticing okay so this is what i used to call it what did i used to call it uh i forget i had a fancy it's something like this it's like speed is the change distance over time right and then acceleration is the change delta speed over time and then you have jerk and stuff like that okay so it's one thing to know that, and it's the other thing to know the thread, the process thread, it's that is, it's, you know, like the delta or the process, the derivative that's beneath it is what I said. And it's something like that that geniuses are doing. They're seeing all this thoughts happening and it's building and compounding, but as they see it of a, as a kind, and then they say, Ah, but it could be this kind. So then everything shifts over with it. And that is what I would say the intuition is. What, you know, why should forces move things? If you think about it, we don't see forces. We call them forces. Maybe forces don't move things. But now you've built up all the complexity from the simple model. So you don't have, so that what you have to bring over is very complex, but you, you know how that, that works. So I would say that's, and that intuition that's based on releasing complexity is usually a metaphor that's very much like the upper left-hand quadrant. It's based upon familiar ways to manipulate objects, but you're manipulating whole systems. Um, and um, that's what I would say makes these, make these significant felt sense um, uh, changes. Does that, does that sound close? Yeah, but you have to be able to, yeah, you have to be complex enough to know that, well, if I do change, all of this has to change, but then boom, 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 boom see that it can fall in line. Um, uh, it's the same thing with uh, the non-real numbers. You know, if you think about the non-real numbers, uh, well, why does one times negative one equal negative one? Because you're using counting numbers as the standard. So if you have two less things, then it's negative two. But then you might say, well, why does it have to be that way? Why, should, why couldn't a negative number times a positive number equal a positive number and a negative number times a negative number equal a negative number? What if we built our system out of that? Well, this is interesting, right? And so it's not a big, the, these moves are, are simple, but not naive. And that's why I think the embodied participation is important. Not all of us are physicists, but the simple, powerful metaphors derived from participation can lead to insights that are are powerful, and then you take the insights, put them back into the participation. Um, yeah. Just like now, like we, we go through these cycles where we think everything, everything wrong with a person is a psychological basis. So we medicate children versus it has a physical basis. We're so like out of physicality, you know? And um, that's an interesting question. What if, what, it, what if it's just the environment? What if it's the building? What if it's the food? What if it's this, you know? But we're so caught up in this that we medicate and get all complex and we have all this stuff and the whole thing in the industry. 
it could be simp simpler, simpler than that, right? So why is the guy in the dog picture unhappy? Because he's not, he's not doing any of that. All these things are just worries and imaginary things that might happen to him and lists he's keeping and stuff like that. He's not bringing, revealing in the reality that's a potential reality. He's not composing a song or remember I said it's all it's all you know that music in his head is all this pop song in his head he's not he's not tapping into the potential for human creativity and this cycle of imagination and participation and bringing things into realization <clears throat> he's just got junk in his head and for people these these other things that are real for us in different ways than they can be real for the dog can be extremely enjoyable and something to be proud of. Friends, thank you so much for coming to Freaky Feature Friday. And uh, for those of you who are starting, uh, finishing the course, we're going to start the final session wrap up for the whole, uh, the whole year's course tomorrow at noon. And hopefully I'll see some of you there and I'll see other people also. Thank you so much. Have a great evening. <clears throat>